Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, and assembled company, welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe, and especially for Little Miracles this week at two o'clock, which is now in the UK. We are exploring the theme of a dinosaur. Whoa. <laughs> and the first dinosaur, so we're doing a couple of stories, but we're, we're doing the first dinosaur story and uh, Pauline Cordner is going to do the story. And, uh, and she wants as many people joining in and shouting as possible during this, uh, this story. So are you ready, Holly? I, I am good to Do go. Do you know all about dinosaurs? I know a fair amount about dinosaurs. Yeah, because yeah. you're a scientist, aren't you? I'm a, I'm a scientist. I love dinosaurs. I've stood in dinosaur footprints. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of you have. Have you got a story for us? Hi. I certainly do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, everyone else that's listening, um, you're going to have to suspend your knowledge of science for this story. Because as we all know, humans and dinosaurs didn't live at the same time. Nonsense. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. Maybe maybe this family got went back in time... Or maybe it's just a story and you can use your imaginations. But once upon a time, there was a family of humans. Mm. That's an odd way to start a dinosaur story, isn't it? But this family of humans lived by the sea, <laughs> on the beach, high up on a cliff, in a great big cave so they could fish in the sea they could get fresh water from a little stream that came by they could get wood from the trees there was flint in the river which they could make stone tools from and sometimes they would take the leaves from the trees and they would weave the leaves to make nice door for the cave because the cave was where they slept and it was also where they cooked most of their food out on the ledge outside of the cave and there was this beautiful path that led down from the ledge outside the cliff all the way down onto the beach and there was a little girl who was part of this great big family of humans and that was her favorite place to play but she would always be warned Whenever you are playing, never go up the great deep gorge because that's where all the dinosaurs live. And well, humans, usually to some dinosaurs, the carnivorous ones are very tasty treats. Well, there was one night when the humans came to bed and they pulled the leather skins over themselves and they started to go to sleep. But there was a problem. See this little girl, she was about seven years old maybe, she could not sleep. And the fire was crackling. So can everyone go crackle, crackle, crackle. Crackle, crackle, crackle. Very crackle, good. Crackle, crackle, crackle. And the wind was blowing outside. But worse than that, Daddy was snoring. Oh, and she couldn't get to sleep. And this seemed to go on the whole night. Crackle, crackle. Oh, crackle. Whoo, whoo, and. <sighs> going to do that. Well, does anybody know what it's like not to get a proper night's sleep? <laughs> the next morning she got up and she went to her mummy and said, Mummy, I couldn't sleep last night because of the fire crackling, the wind blowing, and daddy snoring. And the lady, the mum, said, You know what? I don't know what to do about that, but who will know 
is the old wise man who lives in the shack on the beach. So off she went. And she walked down that beautiful path I was telling you about. And she walked down the entrance to the big, dark, scary gorge. And she crossed the little river where the fresh water and the fresh fish came. And she headed to the shack. Now, this old man, he was very, very wise. And he had a beard that went all the way down to his feet, just like John. And he said to her, what do you think he said, John? I think he said, uh, 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 what, 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 what are you doing here? I was about to get a bit of sleep and you've, uh, you've woken me up. What, what do you want? That's exactly what she said. She said, Mummy told me to come and see you. You see, last night I couldn't get to sleep because the fire was crackling. Crackle, 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 crackle. crackle. And the wind was blowing. <laughs> And Daddy was snoring. <laughs> hmm. And the wise man scratched his very, very long beard, twisted it a bit, like that, and he said, what you need, girl, is you need to go and catch a velociraptor. And he shut the door and he went to sleep. He got his sleep. Now, I want to know if anyone can think, how would you catch a velociraptor? What could you use? Can anyone think? You can take yourselves off mute. Karen, can you think of anything? Um, set a trap. Oh, what a great, a sausage wrap or a sausage bap. Set a trap. Oh, set, set a, a trap. trap. She's from Aberdeen, you know. She doesn't yeah. hear very well. Yeah, it's very quiet up here. Set a trap. And that's exactly what she did. She got a sausage back and she set a trap. And soon, coming out of the gorge. Here comes a dinosaur. Look, can you get me the dinosaur? Get this little velociraptor. <laughs> and it ran and it scurried over. And it was sniffing at the sausage back when the trap went. And she came over and she said to the velociraptor, and said to the velociraptor, the old wise man told me if I'm to get to sleep tonight, I have to catch you and bring you into my cave. Is that okay? Now it was a very clever velociraptor and it understood exactly what she was saying. So the velociraptor said, <laughs> and off it sped as soon as she set it free, because you know that velociraptors are very, very fast dinosaurs. And it ran and it ran. And it sat down in the cave, much to everybody else's surprise. And as luck would have it, it was bedtime. And that night, girl lay down and she pulled her nice furry skin cover over her and she tried to get to sleep. But the fire went crackle, crackle, crackle. And the wind went and daddy went you see that velociraptor well mums and dads and the other adults do you know what it's like when the children can't sleep and they run round and round and round that's what the velociraptor did it was running <laughs> in the cage the whole night and the little girl couldn't get to sleep the next morning she got up oh, and she went to see the old man and she knocked on his door and he opened the wee shutter on his on his uh, sort of shack that he'd built and he said why you want i answered you yesterday i'm trying to get some sleep i couldn't sleep last night because the fire was going crackle 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 and the wind was doing this and someone up on the hill was going and now, and now I, I need to get some sleep during the day and I, I just got to sleep and you woke me up. What do you want now? Well, 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 Mummy told me to come and see you again because last night I couldn't get to sleep because the fire, like you said, it goes crackle, crackle and the wind was going and Daddy, he was going 
And the Velociraptor that you told me to bring into the cave? Yeah, as he said, well, it was running around. Oh, right. Oh, and he said, broke. Oh, well, yes, yes, that was just as I planned. Yes, um, what you need to do is you need to go and you need to catch yourself a pterodactyl. <gasps> and he closed the door and off he went for his daytime nap. Now, how are we, how are we going to catch a pterodactyl? What do pterodactyls like to eat? Do they like meat or do they like vegetables? Does anyone know? Fish. Fish. They like fish, don't they? Well, and you could get it in a net. Oh, oh, what a great idea. So she went to her daddy. Daddy had had plenty of sleep and he was up fishing quite happily, taking in a great big net full of shining silver fish. And she said, Daddy, can I have a fish and borrow your net, please? I, it'll help me get to sleep. So, of course, he said yes. Well, she got that fish. And she laid it out on a big flat stone that was down on the beach. And she hid behind the stone. And she watched. And she waited. And soon, out of the sky. Ah! Ah! I've been practicing this. Ah! came the biggest pterodactyl you could possibly imagine. Its wings were so wide she had to duck down. But it landed on the rock and it started to eat the fish. <laughs> if anything, she took the net and she threw it over it and, and it struggled and it struggled. But eventually it calmed down and when it did, she said, pterodactyl, the wise old man who lives on the beach, whose beard is so long it weighs all the way down to his feet, told me that if I invited you to stay in our cave, I would be able to get to sleep tonight. I'll give you more fish if you do. The pterodactyl thought very carefully and said, Yeah! So he sort of got up when she'd set him free from the net. He sort of half walked and he half flapped his way up to the cave because by now it was bedtime and he settled down in the cave with the little girl and everyone else and the velociraptor and she pulled her big furry skin over and she tried to get to sleep but she couldn't because the fire was going crackle crackle and the wind was going daddy well, he'd been very tired fishing all day, so he snored. <laughs> and that velociraptor was running around. And the pterodactyl was going. <laughs> oh, she couldn't get to sleep. So the next morning, she got up and she walked down the path to the old man's shack and she banged on the door of the shack and he opened the door and he said, what did he say, John? Oh, he said, uh, he stretched. <laughs> uh, and he yawned. Uh, and he said, what do you want? I, I, I've only just got to sleep because last night the fire was going to crackle and, 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 and the wind was going whoo, whoo, whoo. And, 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 and there was a dad in the cave going whoo, whoo, whoo. And, and, and there was, there was some, some, some dinosaur on the going and, and, and then there was the, the, the pterodactyl going wah, wah, wah. and I and, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Oh, I'm so tired. I just want to sleep. And then you come and wake me up. What do you want? <laughs> well, she said to the old man, Do you know what, wise old man? I still couldn't get to sleep. That pterodactyl screeched and screeched all night. And the monster after was running around. Daddy was snoring and the wind was blowing and the fire was crackling. What do I do now? And he said, right, what you need to do is be the bravest that you have ever been. And you need to go into the long, deep, dark gorge. 
And when you get there, you need to just stand there like that as human bait until a T-Rex comes along. And then you need to take it into your cave and see if you can get to sleep tonight. And the girl said, okay. Well, she was a brave girl. And off she went. She went in to the deep, dark gorge. And the walls of the gorge, the big steep walls were dripping with water. There were waterfalls, there were green, luscious plants everywhere, there were vines, there were peculiar creatures, but then she came to an empty sandy spot where the river went through and she just stood there and she went, T-Rex? 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 And the ground began to shake. And there we are, Karen and Isabel have got the T-Rexes. And round the corner of the gorge came this huge head. And the T-Rex looked at her and he sniffed her with his great big nostrils. And he said, hello, what can I do for you? And she said, oh, um, I'm, I'm very, very scared of you. Um, <laughs> but... I didn't get to sleep for nights and nights. And the wise old man says, that if I invite you into my cave, um, maybe I'll get to sleep. And the T-Rex took one of his tiny little hands and he tried to scratch his chin and thought, well, T-Rexes do have tiny little hands, don't they? Couldn't quite reach. And he said, you know, I think that maybe I could do a good deed. Certainly, I will come with you. And to the, the horror of all the other people that lived in the cave, the T-Rex followed her because it was bedtime. And he lay down in the cave Wee. and she tried to get to sleep, but she couldn't get to sleep because the fire was going crackle, crackle, and the wind was blowing and daddy was snoring. And that little velociraptor was going about the place. The pterodactyl was screeching. <coughs> and uh, they want you to get ready, Karen and Isabel, with those dinosaurs. The whole night, because his stomach was rumbling, the T-Rex was going. scary. And she didn't get to sleep. But you know what happened? The next day she went back and... She was so tired by now and she, she knocked on the door of the old man and he came to the door and he said uh, 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 I'm not going to the hole of this, I'm not going to talk about the fire crackling and the wind blowing that's just blown over my dustbin and, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, definitely I'm not going to go on and on about no, the dad, dad snoring in the cave, or the or the dinosaur guys, all around the cave, or the pterodactyl going, all the all the because I'm far too tired. Oh please, please, she said, please. You what on earth you oh. want now? Oh well, now I did what you told me. I took the Velociraptor in the cave and I took in the pterodactyl, the speech, speech, and I took in the T-Rex, but I still can't sleep. And, and the man yawned and he looked at her thoughtfully. And he said, right, there's only one thing for it. Brontosaurus. <laughs> and he went off to sleep. So what, what are we gonna to use to catch a Brontosaurus? What do they like to eat? Leaves. They like leaves, don't they? So, quick as anything, she borrowed one of our big brother's knives. She climbed up a tree. She started cutting down the juiciest, tastiest leaves. And she left a trail of them from the entrance to the deep, dark gorge, all the way up that little path. And it wasn't long before. Where did Ellie's other sock go? Along came a huge 
great big brontosaurus looked down on her from all the way up, really high up. And he looked at her with his tiny eye and he thought with his tiny brain and she said, old man that lives in the shack he's very wise and he says that if I invite you into our cave tonight um I'll sleep tonight really well and the brontos looked brontosaurus looked in the cave and he thought to himself now I'm a big dinosaur and that is a very big cave but uh maybe I'll fit in so he got down and he reversed in and his bum was so big, he hadn't even been eating lots of cheese and crackers and lockdown and he was still huge. And he reversed slowly into the cave until there was only a tiny, tiny little space for all the humans and they were all crammed up against each other. And uh, there was a little bit of space near the ceiling, a little bit of space at the back for the other dinosaurs, and then they all tried to get to sleep. But the fire was going, crackle, 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 crackle. and the wind was blowing, oh, and Daddy somehow had managed to get to sleep, and he was snoring. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That little velociraptor was running around the cave like this. All the space that it could find. And the pterodactyl was up on the roof of the cave screeching. <laughs> and the Tyrannosaurus Rex, he was grumbling. I really don't think there's enough space for me. <laughs> 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 And all you could hear was the rumbling of that huge, great, big brontosaurus as it tried to clear a little bit of space for itself. And the whole cave shook and the whole cave rumbled. And she couldn't get to sleep. So the next day she dragged herself down the steps. And she made her way to the old man's door. And she didn't even knock on the door, but he was out there and he said, right. And she said, I couldn't get to sleep because the noise of the fire crackled, crackled and the noise of the wind and daddy snoring and the running around of the velociraptor and the screeching of the pterodactyl and that terrifying T-Rex. And the brontosaurus, well, he fidgeted and shifted the whole night and the whole cave shook. And the old man said, right, I think it's time for you to thank all the dinosaurs and tell them to go. What, just like that, said the girl. Yes said the old man. And she went back to the bright brontosaurus and he said, oh, thank you. <laughs> Raised his tiny little head with his tiny little brain and his huge great big body and stomp, 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 <laughs> went back up the big dark gorge. And she said, thank you very, very much to the T-Rex who said, any time, please, please don't mention it. It was quite nice doing someone a favour instead of eating them. And he tipped his little hat and off he went up the dark gorge. Well, the pterodactyl was just all too happy to stretch his wings and it flew away screeching, ah! And the little, the little velociraptor ran three times around her and off it went. Well, by the time all this had happened, it was very nearly bedtime. She lay down in the cave and it was so quiet because she couldn't hear anyone running around. No matter how hard she listened, she couldn't hear any screeching of the pterodactyl going, eh, eh. She couldn't hear the roaring of the T-Rex. And there was so much space in the cave that it didn't shake every time the brontosaurus tried to get space. And in comparison to all that, the fire crackling, crackle, crackle, and the wind blowing, and even Daddy's snoring <laughs> seemed so quiet. 
that within seconds she fell fast <sighs> asleep. And after that, that little girl who grew into one of the strongest, cleverest leaders that that group of humans ever had. She never had problems getting to sleep ever again. Whoa. So, Louis joined us while, while that story Bye, was on. Hello, Louis. And uh, so I'm going to do a story now. It's a brand, you are the first people to hear this story. I wrote it this morning because as well as being a storyteller, I'm a bit of a writer. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to read this story and I wrote it. it it's um, and it's fresh. In fact, it's still got all the mistakes in. And, uh, <laughs> and so. And all you need to know, well, you probably know it already, but Zuha and who's in Morocco and Yulio, who's in R Romania, won't know this. But at the. The, in England, the Dinosaur Coast is that <laughs> south coast sort of between Lyme Regis and, and um, Exmouth. And they're down, down the south coast of England. And there's lots of dinosaur fossils there. And that's all you Prince. need to know for this. That was where thing. I stood in the dinosaur's footprints. Absolutely. <laughs> so, actually, I'm sorry, there's not, there's, there's well, I'm not sure there's any joining in in this one, but it's all fun anyway. Um, so I'm going to be looking up and down a bit because I'm reading and I don't know the story well enough yet because I've only just written it. So Michael and Yasmin weren't sure what was happening. It had been a long summer and they hadn't been allowed to see any of their friends or go or go to have their usual summer treats or days out, not even with the club. For as many years as Michael could remember, at least three times over the summer holidays, a minibus with a special lift for him in his wheelchair had turned up outside their bungalow and whisked them away to some unknown destination. Sometimes a theme park, sometimes an airfield. These were always exciting as all the air crew treated them like royalty and proudly showing off their aircraft and sometimes a trip to the sea. This year, there'd been nothing apart from endless virtual treats on their tablets, phones and laptops. Usually both their parents, uh, both their parents and the carer uh, when they couldn't be with the, and both their parent and when they could, she couldn't be with them, their carer was always complaining about the amount of time they spent looking at their screens. But this year it had been different. For months now, their tech had been their whole world. What made today different was the activity in mum's kitchen. Mum, seemed to be making a picnic and packing loads of tins. Not only was she, and not only that, she was folding clothes to pack and checking the medication to make sure there was enough for Michael for at least a week. Was this the great escape or was the plague over at last? Where were they going? They knew better than to ask too many questions when one was concentrating, so they waited. They said nothing over breakfast, which was larger than usual. That was a clue. They cast their minds back to last year. Whenever they were going out for the day, they were always given a huge breakfast. Michael had to have special food and there was never ever guarantee there would be anywhere they were, where they were going. So After they had finished eating, Yasmin and Michael slipped into the front room. Yasmin was always went first to open the doors for a brother so he could guide his chair through without banging into anything. They gave each other knowing glances and began whispering. They considered all kinds of possibilities, but didn't come to any conclusion. Whatever, whatever was happening, they were going to be away from the bungalow for more than a day. Now all they could do was wait quietly. After what seemed to be an age, 
uh, uh, but it was in fact only half an hour. The doorbell rang and there stood Simon, their carer, grinning from ear to ear. And on the road outside stood a shiny, bright blue people carrier, especially adapted for wheelchair users. Mum and Simon ferried bag after bag into the vehicle. Then Mum smiled and calm as you like, told them to collect their tech and their coats and get themselves get in themselves. Simon, Simon, grinning like a Cheshire cat, proudly operated the chairlift. Where on earth did you get this, Yasmin asked. It's a long story, Simon replied. I put in for this months ago and had to compete with loads of other people. Then the plague happened and everything was put on hold so I forgot about it. Then last week, I got a phone call saying I could have it for a week to see if we liked it. And if we did, you might be able to get a grant to get your very own. I didn't quite believe it, but I told your mum and we decided not to say anything in case anything went wrong. Besides, we wanted it to be a surprise. Where are we going, said Michael. That is for us to know and you to find out, replied mum, winking at Simon. It was so long since I'd been anywhere, instead of the continual, are we there yet, refrain from the children. There was continuous grass of pleasure as they looked out the window as they drove along, past the new forest ponies, past the white horse carved into the hillside until they both squealed with delight as they glimpsed a brown sign pointing to Dinosaur Coast. Both of them had been obsessed with dinosaurs for as long as they could remember. They'd collected dinosaur magazines, read every book on dinosaurs in the local library and filled their rooms with models of the creatures. They had pterodactyls hanging from the ceiling, huge Lego Jurassic Parks, for lots of on their desks and every other species along their shelves. They could only hold their breath and hope as they read the sign. Eventually, they pulled into the holiday park. Simon ran into the office, picked up the keys. Then mum told them, then mum told them they'd been given a mobile home for a week, had a ramp and specially wide double doors so Yasmin and Michael could go wherever they liked without mum and Simon always having to be with them. But where were they? The adults told them nothing. So their first journey was back to the entrance to read the sign. At least they knew where they were near. Lime Regis. They hurried back to their temporary home. Race, you shouted, Yasmin running off ahead, but she was no match for Simon's wheels as he pipped her at the post. His speed always terrified his mum who was constantly in fear of him hitting a rock or a pothole and landing up on the ground with his chair on top of him. But she kept all that head. Back at the caravan, they got on their tablets and looked up Lyme Regis. They couldn't believe it. Lyme Regis was one of the best places for finding fossils on the whole of the coast. They wanted to go hunting straight away, but they knew after such a long drive, Michael would have overdone it and the rest of the holiday would be spoiled for the children. Besides, all four of them were completely shattered. The children were so excited, they were sure they weren't going to be able to sleep. But as soon as their heads hit the pillows, they were both snoring and neither woke up until the sun was high in the sky the next morning. Mum had breakfast on. As soon as it was on the plates and in front of them, the children seemed to inhale the food and be off. They had found the best footpath to the beach on their phones and before they got, before they got up. Now, with Michael acting as navigator and Yasmin pushing them along, they followed the path to where they would search for fossils. Time passed so quickly as they photographed fossil after fossil on their phones, some as tiny as pebbles, some as large as boulders. As the tide went out, they crossed giant ammonites. This was the best day of their lives. The hours passed and they didn't notice the tide turn. They had been fighting their way along the coast for miles and their arms were aching from propelling the chair across the uneven tide-worn rocks and soft sand. When they did at last notice, the sea was edging ever closer. It was getting dark, and even with the maps on their phones, they couldn't work out how to get back to the caravan park. They began to shiver. They were getting cold and frightened. 
actually what they were most frightened of was what mum and Simon would say when they when they eventually got back. They must be worried out their wits by now. Then the weather began to turn and the wind got up, lashing them with rain and that began to sting their faces and soak their clothes. It was impossible to move and they froze like statues, each holding on to the other. Both were determined not to cry. In the distance, they could hear a helicopter. Maybe mum has called Air Sea Rescue. Whispered, maybe mum has called, called Air Sea Rescue, whispered Michael. Hardly audible over the sound of the wind, but the whirly bird turned away, obviously searching for some poor sailor adrift in the storm. They were losing hope and a tear trickled down Michael's cheek. Yasmin hugged him closer, trying to comfort both him and herself. Then out of the corner of her eye, she caught sight of a great swirling pot, uh, swirl of water, a giant whirlpool about half a mile out to sea. It got stronger and stronger till a great column of water started moving towards them. She pointed at it speechless. They were doomed for sure. Then out of the column sprung two wings, like giant bat's wings, and a head with huge long jaws. It seemed to be turning from rock to flesh, and gradually the form of a complete and living pterodactyl appeared flying towards them. They stood stock still in a mixture of fear and amazement. The creature landed next to them, nodded its great head, beckoning them to climb onto to, to its back, picked up My, Michael's wheelchair in its beak and took off towards the caravan path. It landed in a field next to the road, only a few minutes from the back gate to the park and disappeared. Michael clambered back onto his chair and the two children made them back their way back slowly to the caravan. Mum and Simon stared at the bedraggled pair. Whatever happened to you, you wouldn't believe it, believe us if we told you, they said. They showered, dressed in dry clothes, and tucked to do a huge meal, giggling and giving each other knowing looks for the rest of the night. And that, that was a, that was a story I wrote especially oh. especially for today. So, oh. Well, thank you for listening. Wonderful. And and that and, and lovely, should we get Paul in a clap? Oh, thank you for having me again. Yeah, and I'm going to be back. Well, what what are you doing next week? Is it bugs and insects? Do you it know? It is indeed. Yes. So I think. Do you want Pauline back? Do you like oh, Pauline? I do yes. like Pauline. Can you can you come back, Pauline? I, I have a, I have a story, but I can't tell you what it's about because that's no no that's no. Make it a surprise for next week. But so we'll have Pauline at two o'clock next week, and then I'm doing the children's stories at six o'clock the see the, the on Friday, not this evening on Friday, and I thought we'd may, maybe Louis and Karen and the family be, between us together we could all make up a story together on that Friday I'll start it and then I'll ask you questions and you can but you can both give me do you want to do that do you want to do that, that really fun. Yeah. yeah and do you want to do that Karen yeah so I'll see you both on yeah. Friday at six o'clock for now Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you so Thank much. You bye, Pauline. Bye, bye. Bye, Louis. Bye, Pauline. Bye. 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 bye.